Hello everybody, welcome back to ACR, Action Comedy Review. Welcome to the third year anniversary episode of ACR. Can you believe it? Three years. Now, normally you'd do it on five years, but I want to make a video. And I saw a perfect chance to film, you know. And it's awfully convenient because the Scott Pilgrim anime is releasing November 17th. Could not have fit more perfectly. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the anime. Uh, Netflix, if you want to hook me up, let me know. So instead, I decided, why not review the movie? Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. And it's perfect because Scott Pilgrim is an action comedy movie. And an action comedy comic, and uh, action comedy video game. So let's not get in the nitty gritty about it. But yeah, once again, unfortunately, I don't have access to the anime, so I will not be reviewing it today. But, if I want to review it in the future, there's always the possibility- Oh, Jake, have you seen the Scott Pilgrim anime yet? What? Pablo, I I just said like three times I Oh, I love Michael Sarah. Your brain just goes a mile a minute, doesn't it? Uh, well, at least he's not slow like you. Come here, you can't say that. Shut up. Ha. Huh. Anyways, viewers, let's talk about the movie. So the movie was written by Michael Bacall and Edgar Wright. And Edgar also directed the movie, so that's a plus. Stars Michael Sarah, who plays Scott Pilgrim, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who plays Ramona Flowers. But I'm gonna just tell you one last person, because this cast is star-studded. I mean, just look at the Netflix announcement trailer for the anime, and you'll see who's in it, because we got some amazing actors like Chris Evans. But I'll end it with Jason Schwartzman as Gideon Graves. Or... The G-Man. It was released on August 13, 2010. It grossed about $49 million with a budget of 60 to $85 million. Oof. That is not too great of a comeback, but the movie's great and it's remembered by a lot of people. It's also very highly praised, I, I might add, because it's just a great a example of a good adaptation. Maybe it's because of the way it was shot, because it's very anime-esque, as it's supposed to be. And you don't see a lot of movies doing that nowadays, so... Like with, uh, Kung Fu Hustle. Very anime. That is very anime. It is unfortunate, however, uh, the director went on to uh, work on Dragon Ball Evolution, one of the worst anime adaptations ever, so, uh... Ooh. Uh, the runtime is 112 minutes, which equates to an hour 52. Oh, and one last thing. Movie was produced by Universal Studios. They even have their own little, like, video game-esque, uh, intro for the movie. But, uh, time to get into the review! Huh? Oh, uh, finally. So we open up to the sky, and the first thing we're introduced to is the fact that Scout Pilgrim is dating a high schooler, as opposed to a 17-year-old, because it sounds a lot more creepy if it's a high schooler. Oh, and I, I guess if uh, you want to be a little asshole about it, it takes place in Toronto, Canada, because that's also mentioned, I guess. But it's a lot funnier if you, you only think about the fact that he's dating a high schooler. Oh, oh my god, wait, 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 did I just hear you swear? We can swear now? Yeah! Ah, crap, you weren't supposed to know that, Kermit. Fuck yeah, baby! Oh, dear lord. Oh, I too would like to indulge in swearing! <laughs> Ready? Poop! Oh, that's... Right, you're, you're an idiot. Yeah. Knives eventually shows up at the door because Scott invited her, but uh, screw that. Let's let's move on to the fact that Steven Stills is just like he's like a little, he's like a little goofy man in this movie. 
He, he wants he wants knives to geek out at, at the band. He's like, oh, is she gonna geek out? Uh, can she geek out? And like uh, Scott's like, ah, I, I don't know, man. Um, you know. And it's really funny though, because Steven Stills just isn't like that in the comic, but it's really funny, so I'm glad they included it. Most of the time he's being like super serious or puking his brains out because he's terrified as hell because he, he thinks the band sucks and he doesn't want them to suck, so. But yeah, it is, it's, it's funny because he's, he's, a little, he's a little goofy man, a little, a little goof, Science. goofball. <laughs> Oh, and then when Scott fucking takes Knives' coat, he's like, Oh, uh, here, hey, hey man, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take your coat. And he like, throws it to the ground. Hey, let me get your coat. Hi. Knives, that's Kim. Why did you even offer to take it in the first place? You're just gonna uh, toss it over. But anyways, uh, Young Neil's like a freaking idiot in this movie. And I like it, because... He doesn't really talk too much in the comic. Like every now and then he'll have like a serious line and he'll be going through like trauma or something. That's about it. He's not really like delved upon too much. I mean like, I unless I got like the complete wrong tone from young Neil in the comics, he's he's different from the comics is what I'm trying to say. I love the, the cast and title introduction. It's just, it's so well done and it's just oozing with creativity. It's just, it's amazing the detail that is put into it. Uh, well, you see, the intro to me is like, if you took a bunch of mushrooms and uh, just kind of like stared at your fridge, like while it was open, looking at all the food for like five minutes or something. What? what? Anyways, there's points in the movie that are just literally word for word, and it's just, it's awesome because you don't, you don't get that with a lot of adaptations, and I, I love it. I love it a lot. <laughs> there, there's not much else to say about that, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. A lot of those scenes are pretty much the same tone as they are in the comics, so it's just all the more better. Wallace's introduction is moved to after Knives' introduction. Let me just say, Wallace in this movie, amazing. But I really enjoy how as soon as Wallace was told about Knives from Scott, <laughs> Stacy just immediately calls Scott because Wallace calls her right away. And you get to see that. But you don't really get to see that in the comic, so it's 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 really cool to see. We then move to the scene where Scott and Wallace are at Knives' school to pick her up. Uh, not much to say about that scene, because like it's literally just word for word, but it's enhanced by the actors' performances. Wallace says, run, or something to Knives, and it's, it's awesome. Now that I think about it, it's very interesting that they came up with the whole Puckman joke because it never happens in the comic. So it, it just, it kind of feels like uh, fitting, maybe? No, that's not right. It's very Michael Sarah for them to do that. I should say that, that that sounds more correct. Ooh, Michael Sarah, my brother knows that guy. Why didn't you make that joke for the description of the movie? Also, like, you kind of mentioned how you love Michael Sarah, So why didn't you mention that earlier as well? I don't know, Pablo. Well, you see, Jake, I have this unspoken rule to never interrupt your movie informational segments because I truly enjoy them. Huh? Who the hell are you? Eminem's rap god, Marshall Mathers! Honestly, I I don't know where I expected that to go. If I'm gonna be 100% honest with you, but like, you're weird, man. And I respect that. 
We move on to the store scene with Scott and Knives, and we're introduced to Julie for the first time. While Knives is looking for a Clash of the Demon Head CD, Julie also pretty much calls her an idiot, so that's, that's, that's pretty funny. Scott makes a comment mentioning the events in the comics, where Envy signs a band that they were a part of to a uh, label company, or whatever, and uh, she becomes a total bitch, as uh, Scott says. Something that I realized now that I neglected to mention was um, the way Scott met Knives was just kind of like thrown out the window. But it's mentioned later on, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit there. So, uh, don't worry, dear viewer. <laughs> I got you. Don't even trip. You wanna... You wanna repeat that last line, maybe? I don't know, I, I don't think I quite got that. Nope! Anyways, uh... A line I, I really enjoy is, uh... The, I've never kissed a guy either line. Um... It, it's one of my favorites, but it's like... Shut up, Scott. You, you're not funny. You're not funny, dude. Like... All you do is fumble. Like, for instance, in, in the comic, all he does is fumble. It's the only thing he does. It's like, I, I just... I want to I beat the guy up. That's what I want to do. <laughs> I would not be talking, pal. <laughs> hey, hey, wait, where are you? Well, geez, that's me. Jake versus Scott Pilgrim. Ready? Begin. Sorry about that, I had to get that out of my system. Anyways, other Scott's introduction is right after Scott's dream about Ramona, which is slightly altered from the comic, but we're not, we're not here for the nitty gritty. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, it's whatever, man. A neat little thing that I really enjoy about this movie is in the background, you can hear what game uh, Young Neil's playing. Like, I think it was at the beginning he was playing Zelda. And uh, right around like the second scene he's in, he's playing like Mario. So yeah, movie Young Neil's a gamer. Young Neil's just kind of like repeating what Scott says during like the party scene. And it's like, it's funny though, because he doesn't do that in the comics, really. But like, <laughs> it just it just kind of seems like they're kind of making them a little little bootleg Scott, because they they're, they're kind of like setting up for uh, uh, knives and Neil getting together. Come you in the the movie is uh, different from what uh, I personally believed him to be like, but I, I think it works. The this one girl title drop is mm, Chef's kiss. What, what was that? Hold on, let me, let me try that one more time. Chef's kiss. It goes pretty hard. And, uh, the, the Puck Man joke strikes again. And, uh, when he, when he talks to Ramona this time, well, for the first time, it's there instead of the, uh, I, I like your shoes joke. Because that's, that's the thing that makes, uh, Scott want to die and go away. It's, it's... Funny though. I really hope the anime does the Mr. Silly Shoes joke, cause I I want to hear Wallace say that. When I read that in the comic, I it made me laugh more than it probably should have. Ha! Fuck man! Ha! Get totally. Jeez, dude, c calm down. I literally mentioned that earlier. You didn't. You, you choose to do it now. 
It, it's like what Pablo did earlier with the freaking Michael Sarah joke. Yes. I really enjoy that they take this time to include the side characters from the comic. Like, uh, Monique and, um... The other one. Because in the comics, they appear a lot more... But, uh, I, I personally would have preferred more, more, uh... Well, cameos from them. However, they, they removed Joseph from the story, which gets rid of a, a, a big plot point towards the end. Like, uh, why did why they do that? I, I suppose it's because Kim, Stephen Stills, and uh, Young Neil aren't as important in this adaptation. Because the movie is focused more so on Scott and Ramona. And technically knives, but... I also enjoy the little references they throw in from like the comics. I've probably already said that multiple times now, but um, I just, I, I like the fact that they do a little nod to the fact that Scott wronged Kim in some way. Like, <laughs> the, the Kim joke is done very well. I, I, I do enjoy that a lot. That time he dumped Kim. Okay, me and Kim are all good now, all right? It's also really cool how they set up the Nega Scott fight like really early on I, I I never really noticed that before or really thought too much about it because like the the way it's done in the comic wasn't really possible due to them cutting a lot and like condensing all six volumes into one hour 52 minute movie but uh it, it is really cool looking back on it especially just with how much stuff they cut i i do like the way they they cut the the parts in between the matthew patel fight i, I feel there wasn't really another way to do it but I, I could be wrong honestly man she uh she really banged scott at the first chance she got or uh as you like to say, bonded with Scott. Ha, huh, you, you get it? Thank you, Kermit. Very cool. Hey, uh, no, no problem, man. I, you know, I, I'm always here to help. I, li I like helping you. We skip everything from the end of Ramona's house to the beginning of uh, the rocket scene with, um, well, not scene, like, segment with uh, the Matthew Patel fight. Um, however, they made up for it with Stephen Stills mentioning um, crashing the boys to Kim, like while well, Scott was talking to Knives, I believe. But uh, it's once again amended by uh, Stephen Stills' drawings of crashing the boys. It's, it's a little visual gag, but... Um, <laughs> it's awesome, I will say. The Crash in the Boys' is, uh, quick song gag is just... It's perfect. They, they really couldn't have done any better. And instead of Stacy and Ramona talking about how she met Scott while they were in the bathroom during the song that the Crash in the Boys plays that kills the crowd, they just kind of like talk where they're sitting. And I think they did it really well because they throw in uh, Knives' meeting Scott story in there. So, always a plus to, to have material that was left out, put into a separate spot that is mentioning it of, of any sort. See, I mentioned it. I mentioned it. Mm, see, I mentioned it. I mentioned it. Oh. Oh. oh, he did the thing. You know, it's really a treat to watch this movie uh, after reading the source material because you get a better understanding of the plot and it just, it adds more 
because you can get the references being made from the story. Well, rather from the characters. Uh, cause the, they'll make like these comments about past events and a majority of them actually are shown, well, no, probably not a majority. All of them are shown in the, uh, the actual comics. It also like, it gives you a bigger appreciation for the people who worked on the movie and it just, it makes the movie Ten times better. They also add a lot of things that create this beautiful world and all these memorable moments. Like, uh, the music, for instance. It's amazing. They create so many memorable songs, like Black Sheep my favorite song from the entire movie. But there's also just like a whole shitload of other bangers from the soundtrack. Also, I don't know if they adapt songs that are from the comics, because they do perform some songs. Um, however, I don't recollect any of the songs from the comic being put into the movie. I could be wrong. I did do some research, um, but I couldn't really find anything on that. So if you know, you know leave, leave a comment down below or something like that. Well, you see, dear viewer, he only clicked on one link after searching it up. So I wouldn't really call that research. So he's a fucking liar. Oh, it's true! I saw the whole thing! Shut up, guys! I'm not supposed to know that! Wallace is commentating on the fight against Matthew Patel is just... It's perfect. It just... It makes the fight... Just... Ten times better than it ever could have been. And like... Hell... <laughs> I'd love to make a fight like that in like a project or something. Cause it just... The way they do the fight choreography in this movie is outstanding. I love the way they do the special effects. It's just, it's awesome, and I think that impact frames should be in a lot more movies than, than there already are. Only one I can think of that have them is this movie. Ooh, have I ever mentioned I've drawn impact frames before? Ah, I was such a good animator. Still am. Stop lying all the goddamn time! Anyway, Scott puts up a good fight against Patel, but then he gets his ass kicked. I really like the way they did the pirate joke because it's a lot more different than it was in the comic. Because originally it was just Scott making a comment about it and Patel gets mad at him. But in the movie, it's the audience members <laughs> making a comment about it. And it just, it adds so much more. I'll say it right now, probably say it again. The Evil X backstories, like the animations they do for them, they're awesome. Because they're literally just Brian Lee O'Malley's drawings from the comics. There's some alterations, like they remove Ramona smoking from the Patel backstory. I remember seeing in a YouTube video, I think it was by um, Majorski's video about Scott Pilgrim. Um, and it, it showed like the storyboards. Apologies if I pronounced the name wrong. Um, not great, I'm not the greatest at uh, pronouncing things. I, I, I should, should say that. But anyways, fight, it's freaking awesome. Um, and Matthew Patel's song, always, it always gets me when I, I watch the movie because I always forget about it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it exists. It's a fire song. But anyways, uh, oh crap, I just remembered. They did a friggin' so that just happened joke. I, I, I mean, I did it. But, but, like, no, they can't keep getting away with this. They can't keep getting away with this.
The Wallace and Jimmy joke, uh, when they start making out, I like how they, they moved it to the end of the fight. Because the build up for it is awesome. It is just... It is the most hilarious thing. Done so well. And we're also finally introduced to the whole idea of the Evil Seven X's. Well, I think it was slightly mentioned, but we're properly introduced to it now. Then they throw in a Seinfeld joke, and uh, I, for some reason it killed me. I, I have no, I have no goddamn reason why it happened. It, maybe it was because of just me blocking it out of my memory or something, but maybe, just maybe, this is the reason why Michael Sarah just drops it so hard. It's it just, the combination of all those things are just, it's, t it's too much to handle. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have to express how much I hate this movie. Um. This text right here is a blatant lie. And I reserve my right to call Jake a fucking sellout! So in the comics, uh, Ramona has like this glow around her head every now and then uh, that happens when like something concerns her. But they, they remove it from the movie. I think I know why, because they kind of like switch things up. So I. I don't think there is a real purpose to it, but it's whatever. Scott's high school backstory is removed because normally it would happen after Ramona like introduces the whole idea of the evil exes. They did do an animation for it that they did for the Blu-ray release alongside the, the DVD one, but, but I don't know, it's whatever. However, they take some liberties and remove some stuff from it, and it's vaguely mentioned later on. I, I will mention it again. It is unfortunate that they remove Lisa Miller, because she is pretty big in, like, the later part of the story, when she does eventually return. I, I see why they did it, because it did take a lot up. I, I see how- I, I see the vision that they had instead of it. However, you can also just watch the, the backstory on YouTube. Oh, and I, I mentioned it earlier, Wallace is hilarious in this movie. He, every scene he's in and everything he says just kills me. It is, it's truly awesome. Anyways, I like the buildup they do for the boyfriends, because um, there's little signs placed everywhere to get you thinking, if you know who the boyfriends are. And like the background of the music shop, uh, you can see a reference to the twins, and obviously you can see Envy alongside, uh, Todd and the drummer. I don't remember her name. I'll put it here or something. But th this is all, like, after you get blue ball from Black Sheep. Ooh, I used to own three Black Sheep. Anyways, Scott's given an ultimatum by Wallace to break up with Knives because he is two-timing her, so. But Scott decides it's best to break up with her when they're hanging out, and the whole scene is in the music shop. The whole scene in the music shop is actually done really well, and uh, it's, it's like beat by beat from the comic, including the bus ride to uh, the band practice. That's literally just the same, and it's done so well. But uh, there's there's some stuff that actually happens after that in the comics that's uh, like cut and cha changed up, but uh, I won't get into that. But after Steven Stills makes a point that girlfriends shouldn't be brought up anymore during practice, but then Ramona shows up because Scott invited her, <laughs> and it's 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 awkward <laughs> to say the least for the, the the parties involved. Kim also mentions that she dated Scott once. And then it cuts to Scott and uh, Ramona at Wallace's while Wallace tries to run off to go stalk Lucas Lee. And the rest goes by the same as it does in the comics, with the infamous bread makes you fat joke. They also throw in the Ramona song, which is fucking funny. Ramona! Ramona! That, that's not how that song goes. I like how in the movie they um, just force Scott 
to fight Lucas Lee right away because otherwise he'd do a lot of training and watching all of his movies. But uh, they kind of give the movie role to Wallace because he's actually interested in the guy. It is a bit sad to see it go, but I think it's for the best. Uh, they get there, and I never really noticed when Lucas Lee actually starts shooting the the scene the, the scene that he was supposed to be shooting. When Ramona and Scott talk during it, uh, you can hear shushing in the background. I, I never noticed that before. It's really funny though. Um, I do, however, hope they kind of like use the movies fight and the comics fight together for Lucas Lee because I'm really in love with the Lucas Lee fight from the movie. It's very funny. However, the comic does it really quick. You know, uh, ju just between you and me, uh, the movie's very hard to watch sometimes because uh, you just kind of notice that Michael Sarah's there. Uh, Scott's just Michael Sarah, and it just it makes the movie a bit hard to watch because you just you know, realize that he's just a goofy guy. He just looks really goofy. He acts really goofy. You know? Very out of character for you, but... Anyways, uh, Lucas's defeat is essentially just the same from the comic. But it's even more epic because it's super cinematic. But then after all that's done, it cuts back to the apartment. Wallace tries to get Scott to say that he loves Ramona. Scott thinks the L word stands for lesbians, but he gets promptly corrected. They do the joke in the comic too, so it's nice to see that. Because I, I like the joke. Because we, we get the... Uh, we, we, we can, uh... We can be lesbians together. Joke. The whole reason why that happens is because they, they do like a more end of the series thing where Ramona kind of like leaves him and he's all depressed. So Wallace was trying to like cheer him up and like get him to go with her. But that's all because Wallace is trying to kick Scott out. Whereas in the comics, it's because Scott really can't afford to live there anymore. So it's got to get out and he moves in with Ramona. But then um, we get back to it and uh, Scott gets a call from Envy, his ex-girlfriend. The one he had before Knives. After that, uh, Knives calls and uh, the best written joke in all of cinema happens. It's the, the whole, is Scott here joke and then like, Scott jumps out the window and then Wallace says, uh, Sorry, he, he just left. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I could do that sometimes. Oh, I can help you with that. You want me to throw you out the window? Piss off! They place uh, Roxy's introduction into the story before the Clash of Demon Heads uh, band scene, which is cool, but there's not much to say about it. They uh, make Julie cuss out Scott uh, about going out with Ramona. Just making another great iconic scene. Uh, Ramona shows up again at the coffee shop that Scott's at, where Julie was as well. And then Envy appears, and uh, she invites Scott to the show. But then we cut back to Wallace's apartment after Scott and Ramona talk about a guy named Todd. Foreshadowing. And then Scott wakes up and we see other Scott and Jimmy in the bed with Wallace. Mind you, Scott's in the bed as well. We get Knives complaining about Ramona stealing away Scott and how she like calls her a fat ass. And then after that, Stephen Stills tries to convince Scott to uh, do the show. Succeeds. Whereas in the comic, it's uh, Scott who brings it up. This kind of makes a little more sense, judging by the way they, they changed up Stephen Stills. Knives then gives herself highlights while she's complaining about Ramona to look like Ramona to get Scott back again. Sex Bomb plays at the show and Knives comes into contact with Ramona for the first time since the Matthew Patel fight. And it just, it creates this really funny scene and I just really enjoy this and I have no clue why. Hey Ramona. Next up, we have Black Sheep! Oh yeah, Black Sheep! Oh, Black Sheep! Oh, oh my god! Shut up, you idiot! The backstage scene is just... It's awesome. Also, Knives gets the highlights punched out of her hair because of Todd. 
because Todd's a raging psychopath. Scott gets pissed off at the airhead Todd. And mind you, this only happens after Scott hears him insult Toronto. So, you can see where his priorities lie. But then, it's revealed. Todd is a vegan. After he uses his powers. Oh, have I ever mentioned I'm vegan? Well, you can't really eat anything, so you're not really anything, I I'd say. Sorry, bud. Stop crushing my dreams! <laughs> we get Todd's X backstory, and uh, it's nothing really showboat over that they did remove some things, but whatever. Anyways, Todd being an idiot is fucking hilarious, because the responses given by Scott is awesome, and just like, the whole back and forth between him and Scott just work. The, the fight for Todd is done very well, and I honestly prefer it over the comic, because it is just such a unique fight. But, but I still enjoy the extra chapters and pages given by the comic, y you know? No, no, I, I don't know, and I don't care. Scott plays bass against Todd, and uh, I really enjoy that a lot. But Scott has failed every single try he's taken to uh, defeat Todd until he tricks him by finding two drinks and mixing them up. Todd, however, thought he got the upper hand, but he was wrong. Oh, I, I just realized the, the crash and the boys uh, showing up again and their fight scene were removed from this. Scott also doesn't get his one-up from defeating Todd. That happens later on. Envy and Ramona's battle were removed too. Ooh! Oh! I forgot what I was going to say. The vegan police show up to de-veganize Todd and uh, ruin him, giving Scott chance to headbutt Todd. And blow him up into a bunch of coins. And that results in Todd's defeat. No! The vegan police can't take me away again! I won't let them! No, no, no! Pablo, stop interrupting! What the, what the hell did you just say? Envy is still a bitch, but uh... She almost... considers being nice. It seems, at least. Until Julie butts in, and um, Julie is promptly told to fuck off. The you're the nicest guy I've ever dated line kind of shows up. It doesn't really do anything there, but um, doesn't really fit in my opinion. A lot of the backstory and scenes are removed from this part of the story, but uh, the gelato scene is, is referenced. And then the group goes to a party, which leads into the Roxy fight, where it's revealed Ramona and Roxy did stuff in the past, and we finally get to see Ramon fight. Ooh, what did they do? I hope they played with Legos. Unfortunately, they didn't, Pablo, but that, that would be funny, um, however. Pablo, they had sex. <laughs> this fight is essentially just the envy fight against uh, Ramona from the comics. Um, however, it's given to Roxy instead. But the fight is badass, and it has a banger song to accompany it. And the fight is just choreographed so well. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. Ramona makes Scott fight Roxy, and when I mean like she makes him fight, I, I mean she literally makes him fight by like moving his arms. I didn't even say anything. What the hell are you talking about? Envy's weakness is given to Roxy instead, where it's the behind the knee thing that makes her weak. After she's defeated, a guy says this. If I got told him, I'd be so embarrassed right now. I wouldn't. Oh, oh really? Yeah, man, I, I, I'm just like that, you know? Scott finally drinks, uh, Forgot to mention that. Scott and Ramona split, but she hands him a list of the rest of the evil exes. Next up are the Katanayagi twins, and they're the next band they have to face. It does suck to see a lot of the story removed, I will admit that, but uh, 
whatever. Instead of Kim getting kidnapped while Scott and Ramona have like a falling out, they do a little battle of the bands with the twins. And Ramona is seen with Gideon at the Battle of the Bands. Scott is distracted by that and the battle starts. Fun fact, uh, the, the warehouse that this fight takes place in is actually where the fight takes place in the comics. So that's cool. Another banger song is played by Sex the Bomb. We get a battle between like these twin dragons and like this yeti monster or something. And it's also revealed that the G-Man Steven Stills was always talking about is Gideon. You literally forgot to mention that at the first Battle of the Bands thing. Uh, you know, the whole G-Man thing. Sex Boy Bomb promptly defeats the twins, and Scott collects a one-up because they racked up a bunch of points from that. And then he suddenly runs into knives, but that's quickly dealt with because Scott runs away because uh, he didn't want to talk to her. This all happens because he was trying to catch up with Ramona, but um, he tries to get back with her when he catches up. Ramona tells him they uh, they have to break up because of Gideon. She She's still being controlled by him. Steven Stills, however, uh, pisses himself uh, at the thought of a, a deal from uh, the G-Man. Steven Stills and Kim sign the deal immediately, but Scott doesn't want to sign it, so young Neil takes his place. Gideon then steals away Ramona, and uh, Scott realizes he said lesbians instead of love when confessing his true feelings to Ramona and his desperate attempt to get her back. Scott's depression arc starts and uh, it starts playing the Ramona song in like really good version of it. And then Stacy tries to cheer him up but uh, immediately shows that she doesn't care because she immediately gossips about it I think to Wallace. But then Scott goes back home and uh, walks in on Wallace banging another dude and uh, he apologizes about seeing uh, another guy's dick during the sit down. Tells him about how he needs to let go and forget about Ramona. But in the comic, uh, Lisa would have been like the rebound home for Scott. But instead of all that, Gideon calls to gloat about his win. And then Scott like spills cocoa on his penis while um, Gideon try tries to figure things out. Wallace then tells him to not give up anymore and uh, go finish Gideon now. And we've arrived at the final act. So uh, go do your little potty breaks, uh, play your little subway surfers, uh, watch your family guy funny moments and uh, I'll sit here and wait. Are right, you good now? Scott rolls up and uh, tells the passwords to the, the bouncers. So if you ever need to get into the Chaos Theater, reminder, here are your passwords. They are... Whatever. And... <sighs> there are, however, some alternative methods to getting in, but uh, I'll get into that later. Scott sees Sex Bobon perform. Steven Stills tells him to just give up. This is what Gideon wants. And then Scott claps back and says, what, what if it, this is what I want? And Gideon does his condescending shtick before they fight, but Scott finally says he loves Ramona. And that gives him the power of love, allowing him to fight with it. It's like a katana that comes out of his chest. Scott uses it against the lackeys thrown at him by uh, Gideon. And then once he finishes all of them, the fight between Scott and Gideon finally starts. First one, at least. But then Scott gets knocked down and it shatters the power of love. And this is just a little thing, but um, originally Scott would have gotten the power of love from the Roxy fight. They switched it up, so. Uh, I wish I had the power of love. Oh, Pablo. I'm sorry, man. However, I love my hat. Gideon, the power of love! Gideon almost kills Scott, but then Knives shows up to save the day, but it turns out she was actually here to defeat uh, Ramona for stealing Scott away. That moves their fight that would have happened a very long time ago in like a mall when Ramona was, was, was with uh, Stacy to uh, here. And uh, Gideon and Scott continue fighting as Knives complains about how 
Ramona stole Scott away. You stole him from me! Dude, you're not knives. You're not a 17-year-old Chinese girl. Why is it all you do is crush my dreams? Scott reveals that uh, he cheated on knives. And uh, in turn, that means he cheated on Ramona as well. He, he admits that to the both of them. And uh, he didn't want to admit that. However, that gives Gideon the perfect chance to murder Scott. Also, Gideon's you can't cheat death line is just... Mm, it goes so hard. Scott is now in the subspace and Ramona reveals her true feelings for Gideon. And she reveals their story, but um, it shows that Gideon has a way of getting into her head. Like, literally, there's like a little chip on the back of her neck or something. She then says, maybe I'm not the one you should have been fighting for. And those are the last words Scott hears before uh, he revives himself. And uh, he destroys the bouncers this time. That is the other method to getting into the Chaos Theater. Now that is a password! Scott finally tells the truth to the band. They sound better without him. He tells young Neil he is no longer... Young Neil. He's now just Neil. And finally, he apologizes to Kim. And she smiles. He also gets points from all this, so. And I, I believe that's the first time Kim smiles in the entire movie, so. And Scott just keeps getting points on points after kicking the shit out of all the lackeys. He finally reveals that he wants to fight Gideon for himself. He doesn't want to fight for Ramona, he wants to fight for himself. And that earns him the power of self-respect, allowing him to fight Gideon. That's actually the dumbest thing ever. You shut up, it's quitting me! Knives shows up again, and Scott reveals that he cheated on the both of them. And that he's sorry. Instead of his jumping around the truth that he did earlier, uh, and he was finally able to just Straight up admit it. And the final fight against the G-Man <laughs> begins. Scott pretty much gets his shit rocked until Knife shows up and turns the tables against Gideon, which promptly makes him swallow his gum. But then it quickly flips around again, and uh, the power of self-respect is destroyed by Gideon once yeah, Scott is thrown to the ground again. And then Ramona kicks uh, Gideon in the balls after tricking him. But then he throws her to the ground and kicks the shit out of her. How are they getting their asses kicked? I mean, like, this guy's literally just a nerd! Don't underestimate the power of a nerd. I mean, have you seen AVGN? Who? Scott and Knives, however, get pissed and then combo the shit out of Gideon. Like uh, the game they were playing in like the beginning of the movie. Gideon is like defeated and he has his little villain monologue and uh, he insults Scott to push him down. But uh, Scott kicks him in the head, blowing it up into like seven billion coins. And uh, Steven Stills picks up like coins after being told the deal is no longer valid with Gideon. Ooh, free money! That sounds nice! I want some! After Gideon is defeated, Scott picks up his glasses. And it, Gideon, his ghost or something, asks Scott, can he defeat himself? And finally we're met with Nega Scott. Although they end up, like, becoming friends. And, uh, <laughs> the whole problem is just, like, resolved as quick as possible. Whereas in like the comic he like fights him and he realizes, oh, he's me. I gotta, I gotta deal with myself. And Ramona thinks it's time for her to go because she just keeps hurting people. She doesn't want that anymore. And the nicest guy I've ever dated line actually works here in my opinion. It's like her saying goodbye to Scott. Ramona walks away, but um, Knives tells Scott to go get her after they kiss. Scott has been fighting for her all along. And Knives is 
way too cool for Scott now. So Scott catches up with her and um, asks if it's fine if he follows along to see if they can try again. And they walk into the subspace door one last time and the camera pans up as the counter counts down from 10, it rolls the credits once it reaches zero. And one last thing, I love how the Scott model from the video game shows up and destroys the the end sign. And uh, that's it for the movie. Honestly, I think this movie alone is a 10 out of 10 in every department. I, I've genuinely thought that for years. Um, I, I just, I think this is one of the best movies like ever made and I, I'm just being honest here. And I think that both reading and watching the series is like the best way to go about consuming the content because it just, it creates a perfect blend and they just, they work so well together. They complement each other. That, that's, they complement each other. That's, that's what I mean. I, I would love to see like three movies instead of just the one, like maybe the first one ends with Envy. Second deals with all the slice of life stuff in between that and uh, when Ramona leaves. And then like the final movie could start the way the first one, or the second one ended. And that just goes to the end. And if they don't have enough for the final movie, they can just pad it out, maybe. I don't know. However, I, I do admit that the movie and the comics are just two completely different universes. Um, Scott isn't entirely the same in the movie. However, they do share a lot of similarities, which I, I do enjoy. As much as I'd love to see just like the comic as the movie, I, I, I do think that it's it's better that they're their own things. It just, it works. And I, I'm not even like going to get into the game because that's its own like can of worms. So maybe I'll play it on stream or something at some point. But I, I have had a lot of fun playing that game in the past with my brother. Because, like, it, it's just, it's a fun game because it's a blend of both the comic and the movie, but it's mostly the movie. Scott Pilgrim is just a fucking awesome franchise. The movie's awesome, the fucking game's awesome, the comics are awesome. And I'm sure the anime's gonna be awesome, but, uh, I, I, I can't wait for it. But I, I do believe that after the anime, the franchise should probably be put on hold for, I don't know, probably, like, 10 years, but like, I'd like to see it put to rest finally. Cause I, I just, I personally can't see any more happening. Cause I, I just believe that both the comic and the movie have like some of the best endings I've ever seen in like a long time. And I, I think that it should stay like that. I don't think there should be like a continuation series. I don't, I don't think it would work. Anyways. That's what I think about that. I can't wait for the anime, and anyways, have fun watching it, because I'm sure it's amazing, and I, I can't review it just yet, because once again, I don't have access to it, but maybe in the future. But uh, here we go. Scott Pilgrim versus the world, 11 out of 10, mm -hmm. yep, that's it. Uh, anyways, peace out. Check me out on all the places in the description. Um, I mostly post on Instagram, but I've been trying to post a lot more on Twitter or X, as like people as people call it now. Um, you know, all, all that good stuff. Uh, like the video, comment maybe. Tell me what you think. Tell me if you want to see me watch another movie. Uh, sorry, review another movie or something, play a game, you know, I'm just trying to make content, because I like doing this, um, you know, I'll see you next time, maybe, or sometime in the future, I'll see you, but for now, I've been Jake, and uh, thank you for watching ACR's third anniversary video. Um, the, the special episode, episode 13, woohoo, I called this Project Plum Tree, but yeah, catch you later. <laughs> smell you later, nerds. Ah, what? <laughs> John Stamos eats glue!